I know that when you were like 15 or 16, you started reading the Dragonlance books, and that was your introduction to D&D. And now you have a D&D video game that is not only one of the most popular video games for D&D of all time, it is also one of the most popular video games of all time. Like this has to be like a, a, a heck of a journey for you, right? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a special feeling. I mean, like, I have never considered it that way, uh, the way that you just uh, said, but it's, uh, it's, it's a bit surreal. I mean, we've been work, 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 finish the game, finish the game, finish yeah. the game. And now seeing how, how much it means to people is, is really special. You had to have known you had a very good game on your hands, but you couldn't have known it would take off this much. What has it been like seeing like the fan reaction and then the critic reception all kind of flood in? <laughs> we were worried, like, oh, there's going to score it 6 out of 10, 7 out of 10, it's going to be a bug, something's going to happen, it's going to break down, everybody's going to hate it. Uh, so that was literally our <laughs> mentality going in, knowing that the content was good. Uh, but we were afraid of that. That was the thing that, that frightened us the most because it's a very big game. And so we know that stuff can go wrong. Uh, although the game usually finds a way of settling back on its feet. And so we didn't expect it to go this well. I mean, like, we didn't expect that... Uh, players were going to react so strongly to it. Uh, but I guess the one thing we did know is that everybody that played it had a different story. And that's the thing I think that the most important ones, people started talking about it, they all realized my adventure is different than your adventure, which is as it should be, right? And so I think that's, uh, that's been very critical to it. And I'm happy that people are appreciating it the way that it is, because we put a lot of effort into it. What you just mentioned there is kind of like the quintessential D&D experience. Like, I had this adventure, I'm going to tell you about the time I did this, yeah. I, the time I fought this villain. You c captured this in a video game form, because everyone's story is different. There's, a, there's something you can share with other people. It's not like a linear storyline where it's like, okay, we all played the same game. Yeah. Everyone's playing a different game. Like, how did you make this happen? <laughs> like, I, I've loved seeing RPGs uh, my entire life. I grew up with them. I know you grew up with Ultima and then, yeah, you know, correct, yeah. everything that's come since. But like, how did you, was that one of the things that was critical to capture that everyone has like a unique kind of bespoke experience? It's the thing we've always tried to make. It's the game where you, you, you get the feeling that the limit is your creativity as a player. Uh, what you do with the systems that we're giving to you, uh, be it alone or with friends. Uh, and it's hard. It's not easy to, to make a game like that. Um, it's also the reason why I think uh, it was good for us that we went so long into early access, because you learn about your players, you learn the stuff that they do, and you try to cover all eventualities, all permutations that go into it. And so we apply that throughout the entire game. We didn't play safe. Uh, we said, we'll take risks. We know they will probably find a way to break the game, but we have this system of rules that we have for ourselves that allows it to fall back uh, in a way that you will always be able to finish it. And as a player, you'll know, hey, all the shit that's happening right now, that's me. I did that, right? So, I mean, I'm, I'm okay with it. And so, and that, that's actually also what you're seeing with players. They, they, there's players that follow the critical path and that they're happy because they got a really polished story experience. And then there's the people that start killing the protagonists and antagonists instantly. And then they're surprised that they can actually still continue playing and that the story picks up and says, well, you did all this stuff, but you know, like here's another protagonist for you to kill. Uh, and so it, it takes off like that. And so it was very much the core of the game when we started working on it. Uh, it's because it had to be a Dungeons and Dragons experience also, which is literally what you have at the tabletop. You come in as a game master and you don't know what's going to happen. You have an idea in your head, but then chaos is going to take off and it's going to go in all different kinds of directions than you expected, which is the fun part. And so that was very, very important for us to put into the game when we started doing it. So we put a lot of effort into it. It's also where that crazy number, 176 hours of cinematics came from. But that was just to cover all these permutations. Uh, so, and uh, it's, it's really rewarding to see it work out also. You have a background in like data and, and that type of stuff. You had an interest in this, you know, when you were in, in college. Is this kind of like just a massive amount of data that you can kind of like, it's, it's gotta be a fun experiment to see all these different choices that all these players have done. You have this great infographic that is like, this is who's playing Paladin, this is who's been rejected yeah. by this NPC. Uh, is that fun for you? I actually don't look at it. Oh, you don't? Uh, well, I, I look at it, I look at the dashboards from time to time, but I, uh, we, have, uh, we have people that look at it. Uh, but I, I try to not do it because otherwise it will influence the creative decisions. And I want to make sure that we keep on investing heavily in things that maybe 0.001% of the audience will see. Uh, because it is important that 
any journey that you take in your game is going to be equally rewarding. And if you would say, oh, 80% of the players go there and they see that, then what's going to happen is that you're going to put all your effort on the 80% experience and you're not going to do anything or less on the 20%. And that's not what you should do when you make a game like this, at least in, in IMHO. So, um, so I try not to be guided too much by it, but obviously uh, I, I pick things up like uh, this, this class is more popular than that. Uh, they're taking that choice more than that. But that's, I mean, it's, it's not a, we don't let it guide to game development. Because there have been other CERPGs that are very, you know, beloved and, and, and I know you like, you obviously like them a great deal as well. Was there, what, were you, what were you trying to bring new to RPGs? Oh, I wanted a AAA uh, um, RPG driven by systemics that you could play in multiplayer with your friends. Uh, and it had to be a cinematic experience. And that was the big, big, big challenge here. Uh, all of the choices and consequences, that was things that we were already doing in the previous games, uh, in the Divinity Original Sin 2 or uh, even Original Sin 1 and even in our previous games. Never at the scale, of course, but I mean, we, we, we were doing them. And uh, having systems interfere with story, we've started building up a lot of experience in this. Uh, but I, I, I really wanted it to be like, hey, it's going to be AAA in the way that it's going to be presented to you. And my hope was, and that's what's happening now, is that that's going to draw a new audience. People that actually don't know they like this kind of gameplay, that were turned off by all the systems and the screens, and it, because it's, it's the onboarding of D&D is not an easy thing. Uh, but I, I was fairly convinced that if you do it properly, in terms of presentation, and you really go overboard with it, a lot of people will be drawn to it. And so we get a lot of people now that are saying, I didn't know I liked this. Right? And that's, that's probably the, the most rewarding thing, seeing like, hey, we brought you into a new type of experience that you didn't know, but it's actually a lot of fun. Right? Because the, a lot of people before said, oh, it's very niche, you're crazy, putting that amount of money into cinematics and stuff like that for something that's so niche. And my, my standard reply was, guys, I mean, the most popular games in the universe are turn-based. Right? Everybody's playing turn-based games on their mobiles. So it can't be that people can't get turn-based games in a video game context. It just doesn't make any sense. And so and it turns out that, that's, that uh, at least for the audience that we're having with BG3, uh, that that's true. You know, I've been covering video games for a long time, and I work at D&D. What was alarming about Baldur's Gate 3 is this was like the perfect way to teach people Dungeons & Dragons. And that accuracy between the video game and the tabletop game, obviously there's plenty of differences, but that's what I'm getting. I am having all these friends who didn't play D&D asking me about it because they didn't realize they would be into this experience that yeah. you have captured in this game. What was hardest to capture? What was most important to capture? I mean, you've got the dialogue, you've got the weirdness, you, the, the, the combat, all of it. Like, what, what was quintessential D&D to you? When we started out, one, one of the, the, the key things was the dice and saying, like, trust the dice, go with it, roll with it, see what happens. Uh, so we, we put that in everything. Right? And so as you were doing that, you realized, uh, well, you know, if we're going to simplify the rules, then everything that's built around the dice is not going to feel true. So we have to find ways to make those rules be approachable. And there's a lot of rules <laughs> in the video game. So we have to try to find a way to hide them, but at the same time make them there so that when you get, start getting interested in, in them, that you can find them. Uh, and so when we initially put the dice inside of the dialogue, and so we made it so prominent and we said, well, here's advantage and you can have two dice and all that. Um, there were several people within the team that were worried that we're making it too hardcore. Mm -hmm. uh, but once you started seeing, hold on a minute, this has an impact on my cinematic experience instantly after that dice rolled, you, it, got, it has you because then you start saying, oh, wait, and I can manipulate this. Shadow Heart does uh, um, uh, guidance. And so you say, oh, wow. This is really cool. And then you're off. And everybody can throw dice. There's nothing complicated about the dice, right? It's just really about presenting the concepts. And so when you see people play at the tabletop, it's the dungeon master says, well, this is how this works. And if they're good, they're going to do it very slowly and introduce people and people get into it. And before you know it, they're min-maxing all over the place. And that's essentially what the game does also. Uh, you see a lot of people, by the end of Act 1, they finally probably figured something out that they could have been doing in the beginning of the game. But it's fine. It has you. And it allows you to play it. And then often people restart because now they say, oh, now I know how all this stuff works, right? And I'm going to start doing these things. I see them uh, cast Guiding Bolt to get advantage and they figured it out, right? And they're happy. And that's, that's the cool part because there's depth to the system that's been ingrained based on Dungeons and & Dragons and all the testing that has gone into that. So they, they start getting that that's an expression of their choice space inside of the game. And the, the rewards the, that you get in the reactivity from the game world to you mastering the system contains a lot of fun in its own. 
And so uh, when, it's, um, when it's all brought together, it's actually very easy to roll into it because it, it, it just lets you do stuff. You just press buttons and things happen and you don't know in the beginning and then you start grasping it. And I guess with a lot of board games, it's the same thing, right? So We have split screen now with PlayStation 5. Yeah. Uh, you have referred to this as couples mode. Yeah. I do, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Why was that such an important thing to get onto console? I, uh, I love my wife and I love <laughs> playing with her. Uh, and so um, some of our fondest memories was playing World of Warcraft, sitting next to one another. She was pregnant. Uh, my son grew up to be an, an incredible gamer as a result of that. Um, but there were games like Dark Alliance back in the days that you could play in split screen, right? And those were really special because it's on the singular screen, you know, when we're in your living room. And so setting up on the PC <laughs> is different than lying in your couch. So I, I always enjoyed those split screen moments and I, I, I wanted to bring that into an RPG that was also narrative driven because that you didn't see before. And so here with BG3 now, you got romance in the game, so you get this incredible experience where you're sitting with your partner and you're romancing somebody in the game, and it leads to really interesting, emotionally engaged moments, right? So, and so that's uh, so I love it. It's great, right? Because it's like it's it's literally because yeah yeah couples are different, uh, and so it's, it's typically it's going really you're going to do that? <laughs> of course I'm going to do that. What do you expect me to do? And so that's uh, that's unique, and so it creates even more engagement uh, in, 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 in the relationship. So I, I really enjoy the fact that Split Screen is there, and the team did a fantastic job bringing uh, arguably a complicated system into like half a screen, because it's not a lot of real estate uh, to bring it, but it plays very smoothly. What do you still find inspiring? Because you know, we, we talked about the fact that you, you read those Dragonlands books growing up. I, I was about the same age when I read them, and, and yeah. I had always had D&D &D in my life like since I was eight, but like that's when I really like, that was like the right age, the right time to get like really sucked in by fantasy, by Dragonlance. What do you find inspiring today? <laughs> You're asking me my next game. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not gonna answer that. Uh, uh, well, I've always had an interest in both uh, sci-fi and fantasy, and then and, uh, there's a bunch of other things, but then when it comes to entertainment, those were always my two, two go-to things. When I explored D&D, uh, &D, uh, Dragonlance was my first one, so I bought all everything. I had this huge case that I ordered, uh, like full of old books and secondhand books. And I like, I just, I just kept on reading and reading and reading. I overread on fantasy because today I'm very, I'm very picky because I read so much of it. So it's like, ah, no, I've seen that before. You know, like it, that's the problem with saturation yeah. of, of, of something that you love. So it's, um, uh, but there's, there's a couple of really good things out there. Uh, so, uh, yeah. But you, but you can't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that's fair. That's fair. Uh, You've cultivated like an incredibly creative team. Like, what, what has been the most important for you in terms of Larian Studios to have like a very creative, healthy team? And you always, even though you you're clearly all working very hard, you have extreme fun in these kind of you know pal from hell moments and stuff like that. Like, I don't get the sense you ever to take eat yourselves too seriously. No, we don't. I mean the. Um the most important thing to the team actually is the players and their reactions. Uh, so you, you have a lot of player empathy within the studio, uh, thinking about what it's going to be like. Uh, they care a lot. If we have arguments, it's because we fucked up somewhere. Uh, so that's where the arguments come from, because, ah, oh, shit, that was not how it was, or that was boring, or we, we broke that. So that is the, the biggest source of, of, of discussions. Uh, but it's, I think that's honestly the the unifying threat it's just care for for the player experience right now i mean like they all their thumbs are hurting from reading reviews and like looking at what they're saying and you would say like that they were they're basking in the success but no it's all about that that's not working we got to fix that we got to do that that's the thing that you're seeing everywhere so that's that's i mean and, and that's what i love about them it's a hard thing to shut down when you were in that mode for five years yeah, like even exactly. when you've had this tremendous success you're still making the game uh like the patches, the patches have been coming out very fast. Yeah. I am not used to that. <laughs> <laughs> like how are you turning these patches around so quickly? And you're also adapting to like, you know, player feedback yeah. very fast. So we set up our studio that it can work 24 hours. So we have studios in, um, in Malaysia and then we have them in Europe and then we have a, our Canadian studio. And so we can basically pass on work. Uh, so that is one of the secrets of Laren. So uh, as the sun rises, work can be done. So that means that if somebody in Europe made a feature, 
by the next day they will know uh, if it worked or not because it went through QA or vice versa. If somebody made something uh, in, in Malaysia, they'll know by the time they wake up because Canadian QA will have picked it up and they will have say, hey, this is something that's not working or you got to fix that and so forth. So that's, that's one part of, of that secret. Uh, the other bit is that we have a lot of automated testing going on. So we have a lot of systems that tell you before you even made the changes, like you broke it, right? Go and fix it again. So that helps also. So we, we invested a lot in that. So taking the benefit of that now, and that allows us to be very reactive to what we're seeing in, in, the, in the community. And we just also have a very dedicated team. Like uh, with, uh, we had, to, there was, for instance, there was a criticism on one of the epilogues uh, with Carlac. Uh, so within the week, uh, I, I just need to check my facts. I think it was within the week. Uh, Samantha, uh, the actress, was called back uh, because we automated all of our systems. So that was recorded. I mean, the first the scene was written, but that went fast. Uh, and then that was recorded just using the pipeline that's been set up. Uh, that was uh, went to the semantics team. Then they spent two weeks working on putting everything in. And then it just rolled into whatever next patch or hotfix was on, on the pipe. And then just they plugged it in there. And that's really cool to see. And so we'll keep on doing that. Larian and you are so player focused that's been evident in yeah. every game that you've put out there and is like you've always been very transparent and always heavily focused on the players and now this game has just completely shot yeah. off that is not it can't just only be about how great the video game is it's also about how you approach talking to players and how you try to make players have a great experience yeah but that hasn't changed, honestly. That's been day one. That's always been there. If you'll go back to our forums and our oldest archive threads, you will see, because then we could still, you, we're engaging instantly with them and discussing features and how to do them. We can't do that anymore because there's just too big. Uh, so it's, uh, we, we have to do some abstraction, but it's, it's literally, you know, um, I have this little game I play with, uh, with dev teams uh, and I, I ask them uh, when we go to there or something like, why are you doing this? Why are you making video games? And you get two answers in general. Um, you'll have the answers and that's typically the engineers. I want to solve complicated problems. Video games are complicated. They're really, really complicated. So if you want to really have um, quantum physics level yeah. of complication, <laughs> video games actually can offer that to you uh, in trying to solve the things. So that's one answer that you get. And then the second one will always be, I'm doing this because I want to create fun. I want to entertain people, right? And that's, I get my kicks from seeing people entertained. And so Larian has just been set up so that it allows uh, developers to have that, right? So as, and, get, and you can only do that really well if you basically r remove all barriers between developer and player as much as you can. And so, and there's risks with that. Things can go wrong in that because sometimes you're too open or you say something wrong without in intending it to be wrong. So, uh, but uh, if you don't do that, then you will, it becomes very, you know, siloed and then you can't really do cool stuff in a silo. It, it's interesting because Baldur's Gate de doesn't specifically have like one genre, right? You can kind of express the genre that you want for yourself because you've given so many choices. I found it so alarming. I, uh, since second edition, I've been a fan of Wild Magic. Back when it was with Wizards and I remember I got the Tome of Magic and everything yeah. else. And I, I get so few time, you know, chances to play, and I played it in Baldur's Gate. And not only is my wild magic surge happening and completely changing the game, as yeah. you know, randomly with like big boss fights and all kinds of stuff, but I talk to someone, they know I'm a wild magic sorcerer, and it's not just there's a dialogue that says they know I'm a wild magic sorcerer. They're saying things about my subclass. Yeah, that's an alarming amount of detail. I know everyone wants like to go past level 12, but like it feels like there's like 18, 100 games in this one game. Like I, I know everyone's going to be replaying this over and over and getting a different experience. Um, I don't have a question. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> surprised by it. This is yeah. I'm being a terrible interviewer. I, uh, <laughs> was there a moment like you're just like this is insane what we're trying to do? We I've never seen that many options in a CRPG in my life. Well, it's it's funny that you mentioned that because we thought we weren't putting enough in it. Uh, so we were so focused on making sure that the identity you created at the beginning of the game was going to be re reflected inside of the game. It was very important to us that if you picked that wild magic sorcerer, that you were going to feel that you were that wild magic sorcerer. And TND happens to have a lot of classes and subclasses. <laughs> so that meant quite a lot of work, but it was never about uh, not doing it. Uh, so it's what I, I meant earlier when we, we chatted and I said like, you know, that 0.01% needs to have their proper experience because they picked that class, subclass, and we offered it to you. I learned a long time ago, our, our first games were very ambitious, but we didn't really manage to 
fulfill the ambition within the game because we didn't really fully support the features. And from the criticisms on, on those games, I learned that it's really important. If you put a feature in there, you have to go full Monty, which means you can speak with animals, you can speak with every animal. You can speak with that, you can speak with, well, <laughs> the trick that we use is like any dead that still has their head. <laughs> 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 So you will see a lot of decap decapitated people in the game. But that's literally how we, did. we solved that's that. That's your cheat? That's my cheat, yeah. Well, have people getting decapitated in this uh, game? There's yeah. a lot of decapitations <laughs> going on, uh, or, or very old bodies. Uh, so, but, um, but that's the, you have to support like that. So when you say that you're going to have reactivity to your uh, class or to your, the, the race that you picked, you, then you have to put it in there. And it has to have, be meaningful, which means that you actually need to have moments that are really about you about your wild magic sorcerer. And then so, and we tried to put that for everything. So we literally tracked down and said like, we need to have enough for everything across the game. So there was a team dedicated to that. So it's, it's really rewarding to see it pay off because indeed, when you're playing in multiplayer, for instance, you see just, what? I can do that? And you didn't get any of that. Well, yeah, it's because you're just like a fighter. <laughs> <laughs> The decapitated head solve is amazing to me. Yeah. Were there other instances of this where you're like, well, <laughs> maybe like we have to hide bodies, we have to do this, like you know, so like you didn't get overworked. Were there any yeah, other absolutely. weird fun facts about this game that people don't know? But it was a biggest source of discussions within team was always like, yeah, but I can't do that. Like for instance, we wanted to do dispel magic for a long time. It was on the table, uh, but then it just became too much because there's so much magic in the game. Like, and it was always, what ha what if I come in and I do dispel magic and say, oh my god, my head is exploding. <laughs> right. So yeah. Uh, so that's why you don't have dispel magic in the game. But there's actually still traces within where you say, haha, they actually foresaw that and they wanted to do it and we wanted to but it was just too much it was literally it would have doubled the size of the game uh, just to support that one spell properly yeah, yeah. no absolutely D do you play DD yourself the tabletop game my version of DD is uh, playing with the kids in the car uh, so i basically come up with a story and then they say so what's and i said what, what do you do and they say what they do and then i roll fake dice in my head <laughs> and then i tell them what what the outcome is narratively like what is the thing that gets you excited like was an important story that you want to tell. And obviously that story, mainly it's you handing it to the player to create that story, but what, what, are, the, what are the story elements that got you most excited for Baldur's Gate 3? Baldur's Gate 3, the teams that we put forward in the beginning were survival, trust, and uh, those were very important ones. Transformation became one through uh, development. Obviously you had the mind player, but it wasn't the, the, the initial main team. But ultimately then when we looked at it, we said, oh my God, there's a lot of transformation stories in here also. So, uh, so we started doing that, but it was really about trust. Uh, you're put into a very difficult situation and you're with people that by nature distrust each other. Uh, so, and that are some of them are set up to have conflict with one another. So how does that grow? Uh, so that was the, the thing I thought uh, was very interesting about um, the game. And we, I, the writing team, uh, really pulled off some unique moments throughout. But it was very complicated because you got all that freedom and you still needed to have all that party relationship, all that companion relationship uh, going on. So there was a, um, it was really, really complicated. Uh, but um, uh, it feels good because you start with this group of distrustful people and depending on how you play, you end up with a band of friends uh, that will go through fire for one another and that, that's the essential part of the companion experience. Uh, so, I, uh, yeah, so I think that's probably the, the, the biggest one for me, that, that feeling like, hey, you know, I didn't like you in the beginning, like uh, often a lot of people don't like Lysel, but she's a very deep character and at the end of the game say, oh, wow. Right, so I didn't know all of that was going on. Shadowheart, same story, right? I didn't know all of that was going on. There's a lot of people that say, oh my God, when they get to, to Act 3. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, th those are the biggest narrative rewards I find. What do you like about video games like compared to every other medium, like movies, like tabletop, uh, you know, like podcasts, books, whatever, like what is it about video games that excites you so much? Well, it's the ability to have a narrative that you can uh, modify. Right, so, and that goes, even if it's a very systemic driven game, there's always a story in your head and you are the one that is changing the pieces uh, and, and the game shows you, okay, well, you did this, now is the new state and you can react to that. So it's that, that engagement loop that's continuous is the thing that uh, I always was attracted to in video games and what we really try to put in the games like BG3, uh, but also big strategy game nerd. <laughs> that's the alarming thing is yeah. um, uh, there's so many people I know have learned so much about D&D through Baldur's Gate 3 or I'm, like there are articles that have been written as well about this, but I'm witnessing it in my own players of 
everyone's become very tactical suddenly. You've kind of changed the landscape for yeah. D&D tabletop because some people are just like, oh, if I'm up here or, you know, knocking people around is everything. And the number of times people are asking about, if can I shove? <laughs> <laughs> so it's had an effect, like yeah. you know, across genres, and yeah. that's what's been really exciting. That's got to be very gratifying for you to see, like, okay, this thing's in a video game, but now it's affecting tabletop players at the same time. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, so I uh, I hadn't looked at it like that, but I, I, that that is cool. I mean, like, it's uh, that's the benefit of the video game, right? So f I, I'm pretty sure now that you mentioned that verticality will become a thing uh, because we put a lot of verticality in the game, in the in the landscape, uh, and, and using uh, surfaces and and things like that. Uh, I had this great story that I got yesterday from a, a streamer and so she, she was super excited because she found a way of killing a boss and so she sent me a video and so it's uh, it's in the underdark and there's a there's a moment when there's like big hammers like mechanical hammers coming out of the sky and uh, you get crushed when you're under it and you get killed and you can control them with a lever which is further away and so what had she done she had taken herself with the boss that was chasing her it was a really hard boss she had come to stand uh, and there's lava all around her and so she could she put herself on the uh, the spot where the hammer was going to come down the boss is standing next to her she dropped a healing potion on the on the floor and then she shot the lever right the lever is triggered by just because she shoots at it so there's force on it the hammer comes down killing her and the boss but it also destroys the healing potion the fluid comes out of the healing potion the healing affects her it doesn't affect the boss because it's a mechanical <laughs> boss and so she survives and that's how she kills the boss it's beautiful uh, i love it you must love complexity i do yeah <laughs> <laughs> The, the fact that there are that many different interactions, like, yeah. is there like just a weird interaction team or like, is it that, that, that process you just told me about of like, well, can we do this? Can we do this? Why can't we do this? I'm going to want this. The fact that you have a healing potion that can break yeah. as someone dies and bring them back, yeah. that is bonkers to me. I, 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 that is such a level of complexity. No well, we one's expecting. Yeah, we didn't foresee that one ourselves. Like, yeah. so that's just the, the but we, we try to make our systems uh, intuitive. Uh, so if I got a potion and I break it, well, fluid has got to come out or a gas got to come out. Yeah. It's sense, right? Then you can start playing with that. And so we, we, if you look at all our video games, one after the other, we do more and more and more of that. Uh, so uh, there's the, um, well, everybody knows about the alt bear now. It's heavy. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it can, can do a lot of damage. Uh, but there's uh, the throwing gnomes uh, party. Uh, there's, a, there's a YouTuber, there's four of them. There are four gnomes and doing like really crazy stuff by throwing and stuff. It's fun. It's a lot of fun, right? So we put those systems in there for you to abuse them in that sense. So our, our thing really is bring that level of systemic freedom and marry that with narrative and make that work in all cases, as chaotic as it can get, uh, and try to get better and better at that. That's really the focus of, of, of how we approach the video game. Was there a moment for the video game, like while you were developing, where, where you were like, that's it, that's what we've been chasing, that's what we're trying to capture? There has been in BG3, there have been moments where I said, okay, this is really, really good. Um, so there are a certain narrative moments where the cinematics, the sounds, uh, the music, the visuals, they all come together and then the line is delivered and you say, wow, that's really... And you go silent. You know, you're sitting there and you, you look at it and you say, okay, that was, I mean, that was a cinema quality experience here, except I caused all of this to happen. This is here now because of my choices, which is the very special thing about the video game. So that's, I think, and BG3 is the thing I'm the proudest of, that, that we achieved that, that we managed to do that. And at the same time, mixing all the craziness, like what I just said with the healing potion, right? So you have those two things combined. It's, um, it's the type of video game I like to play. It's what I, I when I started making video games, uh, I had that sense, obviously not at this level, from a game called Ultima 7, uh, which has been my, my shining light uh, for forever. Uh, but I got that sense of wonder and exploration and adventure and interaction and the ability, because you could stack crates in that game already and make stairs to get to a higher thing. It was crazy yeah. at the time, right? So um, It felt like the future at the time. Exactly, yeah. And then it got shut down because we got this entire wrong distribution model back in the days. Uh, so that, that's, uh, that sense, uh, chasing essentially for every single video game. And so I'm happy with what we did, but we can still do better. Does this feel like a moment in your career or is it always on to the next game? Because this is such, a, to have this much critical acclaim, to have this many fans, and it's only just begun. Like, I'm going to be hearing about Baldur's Gate 3 for 
20 years from now. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I know I am. Yeah. Like, you must know that on some level as well. This is a, a massive career moment. I, uh, not really. That hasn't, and, and yes, you're right. I'm busy on the, for, on the next game. I mean, I, I never play my games again when they finished, right? So, and uh, it's really funny that you ask it. It's the right moment to ask me, actually, because yesterday morning I was in Quebec, uh, and I woke up in my bed, and I called my wife, and I said, well, I'm, I'm, my black hole has arrived, uh, because the PS5 version is shipping. We just uploaded it, yeah. uh, so I'm done. Uh, so I'm going to move on to the next game. The other team is going to be working still, and there's going to be patches and epilogues and stuff like that. But for me personally, this creative path, or it's done now, right? So it's a, I am closing the chapter, and then every game developer will tell you that when you've finished, there's always this black hole because you've been under adrenaline for so long, and you've been working towards this cliff, and then it's like, uh, hey, I reached the, the the point, and now what? Right, and so you got to start again, and but you have to calm down first. You have to you have to take time for yourself and, and have a break. So when people ask us what's next, it's a break. But you're already thinking about the next thing because you've been sitting on it for some time already. So there's a lot of stuff that's already moving in that direction and eagerness to start working on it. Uh, but you you do have to take a moment uh, because it is a, this is a very intense industry uh, to be in. It's not the same, but Dungeon Masters after a three year campaign, they end that stuff, and then the, yeah. you have this kind of weird like. Well, I'm thankful I have my Sundays free for a while, but yeah. also like now there's this kind of black hole, like that, like you experience, like you're yeah. you're doing it because of the fun of it, like you you are developing a game because you love it, not yeah. not because you're trying to hit some end goal. Exactly. Yeah. Pell from Hell, as I am, well, I am clearly in video. I love how like fun Pell from Hell is. It is not your typical like dev update or anything. You, it's just like a. I hope it's a moment for all of you to like. Enjoy yourselves and goof off a little bit at bef in between games. It's uh, yeah, no, it, it, they're a lot of fun, right? So we all enjoy them, and then uh, a lot of team bonded over it just watching them because they enjoyed it themselves. And we instantly afterwards we got all the criticism. Ah, you did this well, I, mean, I enjoyed that. So they were very vocal in their feedback on, on how we did felt from hells. Uh, so, but they were just a lot of fun. I mean, it's just goofing around and, and, and uh, talking about something you've been caring about for a long time, which is the game that you've been making, trying to show off all the stuff that you're proud of because you just made it at that moment in time. So usually the features are very fresh, which also means that just before there's a lot of stress because it's going to break, it's going to break life and so forth, uh, which happens actually on our final battle from hell. There was a moment where uh, I wanted to show off two different uh, versions. So Adam, our lead writer, uh, was, was doing one version of an encounter with the rider and I was going to do the other version of the encounter with the Drider and because um, somebody else in the team was also showing something up. They had been rehearsing, so they overwrote my save games. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I mean, yeah, I remember that. And I'm like there and say, what the fuck? <laughs> 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 and so then in my, 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 my summer armor, because it was way too hot to fall, uh, I tried to, on, on stage, try to cheat my way to the point, but I fucked it up. <laughs> And uh, so that was like, uh, I've always done it, so we know we have some leeway with the, with the fans. They know that we, I mean, like, it's genuine, right? It's not a pre-scripted path through, uh, I mean, we know which path we're going to take, but it's... Yeah. I did that press tour at that moment, and I had two, there were people that were in the audience twice, and they had completely different presentations just because the dice went yeah. wrong. And it was great, right? But I had to improvise everything. And so, and then, but that's literally what the game gives you, and that's what you're hearing from everybody also, right? So I was at the show floor here on PAX, and uh, there were people that came to me and said, I did three plays of this game, and they're all different, right? Just because stuff went wrong. And so, and that's... Uh, but it's been made to, to give you that. That's literally its purpose. Uh, so I'm happy to hear those stories. What do you think is the most important when you're trying to tell a story with other people? Because that's what you've effectively done is you were essentially a dungeon master to, I assume, millions of players. That's what you've done. So what's, what's your advice for like those who want to tell stories? Respect choice. Don't say no. <laughs> uh, so that's probably it. I mean, like the um, this is, has been the thing like, because very often when we were making the situations for this, and what if I do this, and the reaction and it's really to the credit of the team is not, oh, no, 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 we're going to block that off. No, no, how can we make it happen, right? And so I imagine um, that when you have your campaign in your head and you want to get them and you want to say, oh, I want to go and defeat Tiamat or whatever, uh, it's going to be like, uh, well, and I did this, and then you could block it and not do it, but you really should go with it, even if you have to throw away your story, uh, because then just go with that. So it's like, uh, so roll with your players, essentially, is what I would say.
What's your best advice for people who are playing Baldur's Gate 3 or, or haven't tried Baldur's Gate 3 yet? Like, how, how do you cook some in? I, so many D&D players are actually excited to play Baldur's Gate 3 because it has, like, again, captured that experience. What's your advice playing for a player? Just try things. I mean, like, uh, the game has a lot of, like, what we just talked about with the healing potion. Uh, that's the kind of stuff that you're not going to plan for. So it's just keep on trying things. I mean, then you will often find uh, that the game will react to it. Uh, even if you didn't expect it because you're not used to it. Uh, so, and there's a lot of effort was put into failure in the game. So when dice went wrong, uh, so don't necessarily reload if you can't manage to convince someone or something to do, just see what happens when you do those things. So it's, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's room for a lot of experimentation and you will be very well rewarded. And the more you explore and the more you try things out, the more you actually will be rewarded by the game. You mentioned Dispel Magic and how that was kind of going to be a game-breaking or the whole game could just become about Dispel Magic and yeah. how it affected the map and everything else. What are, do you have a list of spells that were just like, oh, <laughs> these are tough, but you still have them in the game? Uh, animal handling, animal and speak with animals. <laughs> so the, the, just the idea that we did both of them is like added so much dialogue to the game and so much effort because, uh, but it had to be there, right? Because there's, it's very different to handle an animal than to speak with the animal, yeah. right? So, so that, was, uh, that was an extensive one. That was, uh, I think, uh, speak with dead also. I said all the dead bodies in the game. <laughs> <laughs> like, so, and so we put in the five question rule uh, in there also, so you could only ask five questions. So that was a bit limiting. I'm not sure if that was as good as we wanted it to be. Um, I think uh, this guy has definitely caused uh, quite some systemic issues for us at the development front. I mean, but it works. Uh, so that is, uh, um, I did a thing with a, with a streamer uh, using seeming, which was really cool. So, like we heisted the bank and then our accounting house. And then we said, uh, and one of the preparations that we did for that, we did then the seeming and just <laughs> so it was fun, right? So it's, uh, so that kind of thing. Uh, so those are things that require uh, a lot of effort from the development point of view. Uh, but I'm f happy that they're in there because that's not what you expect to find. So it's, it's good when you find these things. Like the Bard also, I mean, if you see how much effort went into the Bard, I never would play a Bard in my life. I wouldn't even be close to touching it. <laughs> I, I have changed though, I've seen, I have admitted that. But um, with Original Sin 2, when we did the Kickstarter, we actually had a poll in my, executive, uh, my head of production. Um, he said, like, we should go with Bart. And I said, well, we should do a polymorph class for sure. We should not be doing Bart. Nobody likes playing a Bart. And so <laughs> the audience agreed with me. Uh, so they all went for the polymorphing class. So we implemented that into the game then. But, the, um, but here, with what the team did on the Bart, and then playing together, and then suddenly the music streaming in, and then all the insults, all the taunts that you could do. Uh, I, I find, yeah, it was really well done. But, it's, uh, but yeah, it was, again, a lot of effort trying to support uh, non-combat. Uh, interactions, right? So, because what did they do? Well, why am I playing this music? Well, you play music and you do it well, you get money. So, people start throwing coins at you, right? So, that became then a decoy tactic. So, people started using that to rob places because they had their bards playing music, people come to watch, and in the meantime, they steal something. So, it's great. It's again that role playing that comes out of your system, you creating your own little story. Is there something you're gravitating? Because you mentioned you're not really a bard person. Like, what, what kind of person oh, are you? Everyone's wizard, got... always a wizard. Always a wizard? Yeah, always a okay, wizard. okay, why yeah. is that? Look, is it again the complexity, the, the number of choices? Yeah, yeah. So I hate the spell slot system. All right, I mean, like, uh, my, my lead gameplay programmer had to explain to a really competent engineer who has a PhD what spell slots are <laughs> 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 for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> right, so yeah. before he actually understood it. Spell slots are a bit complex. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when I was teaching my own wife D&D, &D, uh, it came up and I'm like, this is hard to, ex to explain. It's really, really <laughs> yeah, hard yeah. to explain, right? I mean, ultimately when you get it, it's straightforward, but it's yeah. hard to explain. So, so that kind of thing. Uh, I have to ask, what type of sub is there a subclass of wizard you enjoy? I, I tend to gravitate towards necromancer just because Yes, having a bunch of undead fan friends. So, ev evocation wizard, um, because that allows me to do the elemental shenanigans and uh, it gives my party immunity to it. Uh, so, but necromancy would be my second pick. Uh, so, uh, has there been one big surprising thing? Like someone's gone back to you, like because you are seeing all these streams now and you've been on streams yeah. with people. You were with Matt Mercer, like yeah. stacking crates and trying to break the game. But that, you seem to love that stuff. Uh, yeah, no, that's it. That's that's what I love about the game, right? So stacking crates on top of a house to be able to just jump in or fly in. Uh, that's exactly what I want people to do in this game. That's what it's made for. 
as that's why we put all those systems in there. What's the craziest thing I've seen? Well, I got to say, what the uh, Luality is the name of the streamer with the with the with the healing potion. Yeah. That, that is a level of complexity. I wouldn't have thought of it. I, typically, when I demo the game, I try to find combinations like that just to show it off. Like um, we did the gaseous form uh, break in into the counting halls. Uh, so uh, through a pipe, it's fun. Right, you can, the game allows you to do that, and that was not pre-programmed, by the way. Uh, so that was not pre-scripted at all. Um, but um, the rule was that you had to be a tiny creature to be able to get through a pipe. And so I uh, went to system design and said, "Well, if I'm if I'm a cloud, surely." Yeah. And he looked at me. He said, "I don't know." Right. <laughs> he says, "I don't know." He says, "Right." Uh, but normally, if they did their jobs, so talking of his uh, his other system designer. I guess so, and I went through it, and I was slay like a child. I was so happy that it worked. Right? I thought it was so cool. I, said, I got definitely got to show that because it's just uh, it's one of those things. It's, we set up these rules for our designers, and then they start and they they work, and everything clicks like clockwork. And then you get these. This is the outcome that you get at at, at the gameplay level. This has been such an achievement. Like, what is key to having like such a healthy and like driven creative team? Giving them ownership. I think that's the most important bit. So you need to give, uh, give sorry, <laughs> you need to give uh, the developers ownership over the things that they're creating, like all the Bart stuff. I'm not the guy to design the Bart. I clearly don't play Bart, but there was a group uh, that was really passionate about the Bart, and they came up with this fantastic Bart implementation. Uh, like you're interviewing Ross at some point, uh, so Ross is the monk guy, right? So the monk is his. So he will be able to tell you a lot about the monk. Uh, I think that's the most important bit. You find people um, with things in, in the game that fits what they're interested in, and you give them ownership to do their stuff. And obviously, you need to have directed a little bit in the same direction, but you'll get the best results like that. Um, so I don't really believe in the big top-down model, how are you going to do it, and this is, the, this is the formula, right? And we're going to apply the formula. No, you get much better results by giving freedom to your team and, and, and ownership over doing things. And then giving them room to fail also, because I mean, you can't be creative if you can't fail. Uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't work. You will fail a lot when you're being creative because you have to have the freedom to explore what I call the search tree of creativity, right? So, and sometimes you, get a, you hit a dead end, you don't know, uh, because if you don't explore it. Uh, but exploring takes time also, so you need to create the time. So, it's, uh, so I think that's probably my, um, the thing that we do more and more in our development, uh, obviously, because we have more resources now than we used to have. Whilst we have, yeah, we're always time constrained, budget constrained. That's uh, that's not as tight anymore as it used to be, and so that makes a difference. So we can, we can be more open in it. But it's important that that freedom of, of exploration is there. You talk about uh, you know dispel magic also being a breaking thing. Uh, you know levels one through twelve. You and I both know after twelve things get pretty nuts yeah. in D and D. That's when like the spells get just world shattering, hard to capture in a video game stuff. That is why we're keeping it to one to 12 for Baldur's yeah. Gate. Yeah. That also makes it hard to do DLC if, if you were ever tempted. Yeah, well, you could, you could do different things and so it doesn't have to be necessarily at the end of the game. Uh, so there's, there's, a, there's different ways that you can do that. Uh, but it's, you could make a level 12 to 20 game, it's a different game, right? Yeah. So it's completely, you would approach it completely differently. It's, um, so yeah, that would different stakes, different environments, most likely different protagonists, antagonists, uh, but not undoable. I mean, like, uh, but different. Has there been something from the fan community that has like shocked you, like in terms of like 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 just fantastic art, cosplay, something that was just oh really God, inspiring? Yeah. yeah, no, it's crazy. It's like it's literally. I mean, like. Uh, Social media is full of it. The like the songs, uh, drawings, uh, videos. Somebody did a puppeteer show. Uh, it's great. Uh, it's like it's really. This, this is the most rewarding. We have a hole uh, that we're uh, filling in our studio with just with artwork from the fans, right? So it's uh, it's it's really nice. It's really nice to walk in there when you see it. Like the uh, graphic novels, comics. Uh, it's it's really really cool. Is it weird celebrating? Kind of like you mentioned, like okay, PlayStation Five launched today as we're talking. Yeah. You're walking the show floor at PAX amongst all these gamers who are excited to drop by the booth. That's a moment, yeah, right? Yeah, That's sure. gotta be a little surreal. Yeah, it's a, I, um, I tweeted this yesterday um, because I'm in the hotel room. Yeah. And by coincidence, they put me in the same room where we launched the Kickstarter for Original Sin 2. So I was full of nostalgia, of memories, because we were, we were all crammed in that room, uh, like uh, everybody from, uh, from, uh, from the dev team and publishing team that was working 
on, on typing and doing updates and reacting to community interaction back then. And, but now I was alone in my room. Uh, so and not that that was a sad moment, <laughs> <laughs> was, uh, but I was there and I was just, I was remembering seeing all the people around me and the activity that we had in it. And it says like, uh, well, we're launching the PS5, I mean, but it's dumb. It's like, that's what I said. So, I, it was, uh, so yesterday I was in my dumb mood. Uh, I was like, I'd woken up. Called my wife, told her about it. Like, yeah, hey, my black hole has arrived because it's dumb. So I have, to, and there's a there's a bit of me that's like that I have shed. Uh, so because it's now in the past, and so the so that's and that's the same feeling I'm having today, right? I'm really happy. I was uh, doing an interview at the, at, the, at the show floor um, just before I came here, and I saw all these people playing in split screen and control, and it looked great on 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 the TVs. Uh, I felt very proud about how visually. How striking it was, and already they were all in different circumstances. So that was also cool to see uh, how that was working. But it felt like okay, this is dumb. It looks dumb. Uh, so um, I know that because if I say that, I will have an entire uh, fans that are saying, "Well, we need this, this, and this." That's all coming. Uh, but I mean, the team will, will will handle that. Is there anything that you've wanted to express to fans that you haven't already at, here at the end of all of this of this like this massive journey you've had? I just want to thank them. I mean, like the, it is impossible to make the game that we made without what we got from the early access community. I mean, like they, uh, there were a lot of people there that were there throughout the entire journey. Uh, on Reddit, they had their community updates that they gave uh, every week, where they were saying, "Oh, these are the things that we have in the game that we'd like to see to change." And like, um, that's been huge, uh, and that's been a huge help. I, I wouldn't want to do it differently. Uh, I don't know if we're going to do another early access. I would. Can imagine that we do. I mean, but it, uh, but um, I yeah, it's been because sometimes it's frustrating. <laughs> so it was, but it was without without that part of the journey, it would not have worked. So I'm very grateful for them, and also actually even now, right? I mean, like we have bugs in the game, so they they pop up, but they're very understanding and they. They, they have patience in that sense also. I mean, we're frustrated when we see those things. Uh, so we don't want them to be in there, but they're uh, helpful in sending us the feedback, telling us this is what I did, this is how it happened. And so that allows us to fix it. And so somebody else's journey later on will be better as a result of that. And so that is a, uh, I, I think we, we, we really had the symbiosis between developer and player community that, that came to, to life in BG3. And I think that's also one of the reasons why the game it turned out to be as good as it is. Uh, so if you had to do this in your silo, I don't think you would have managed. Uh, it would have been very hard. Uh, I just have to say thank you for making such an amazing game. Because what we talked about earlier, where you, you, know, you have all this fantasy coming at you from all these angles, from books and media, and you consume all of it, but you get more critical the more you consume. Yeah. Baldur's Gate 3 is one of those wonderful things, especially for me who used to review video games. I get to like, this allowed me to be a fan again. <laughs> like I just got so excited about all of it. And I'm like trying to like squirrel it away and, and play it as slowly as I can. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it, you've done a, a remarkable job, well, all, thank you. all of you. Yeah. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank you very much.